evening. Welcome back to Spirits and Ghost Stories. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons. And I'm Carly Bird. Week 45. We've made it to week 45, which means we only we have less than 10 episodes, I think, left in the year. Crazy. And you know what? I am quite terrible at math, guys. So hold on for a second. While well, I go 52 minus 45, which means we only have seven weeks left <sighs> until we put a year. That's crazy talk. I can't even believe that. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty sobering when you really think about it that we've actually made it this this long with, you know, only like two subscribers. So that's pretty impressive. And I so, know. Huge shout out to my mom and the other rando who actually wants to spend their time with us. I'm so sorry your life is so depressing that you really feel like, hey, you know what? Hey, don't this beat is up the, better the people use that my, listen to us. This is the best use of my time. Don't beat them up. But um, how are you doing tonight, Carly? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Uh, it's a Friday night and I am just super duper excited that the weekend is here mm -hmm. upon us and uh, cu a quick couple of announcements before we get into today's uh, episode we sure got a whiz banger of an episode here too uh we're moving episodes to tuesday morning is when they're going to start dropping tuesday mornings based on the analytics clearly you guys like it more when i release them during the week which makes sense again um we maybe every now and then we'll release them on a friday but i'm trying to be consistent and our data is better when we release them during the week so that's what i'm thinking that we're probably going to do um yeah, besides that, and we're going to have a cool, spooky episode next week, uh, really to kick in the summer, more summertime vibes. It's a summertime vibe kind of ghost stories. Getting back to our roots. You know, we're called Spirits and Ghost Stories, and we pretty much should be called it Cryptids and Monsters. So let's go back to why we're going to have a spooky ghost oh, story. Oh, you're right. Next you're right. Week. We'd like to give a shout out to one of our YouTube subscribers. Um, your handle on YouTube is Lady of the Veil. Thank you so much for your comments, your feedback. Your love, we appreciate you. Yes. Thank you for watching vibes, our episode vibes. and thank you for giving us some recommendations. Because of you, we are doing our ghosty stories again next week. So be on the lookout for that. Yep. And and this is just to show everyone if you guys want to comment, you can email us. Uh if you listen to us on Spotify, iHeartRadio. Uh, or Apple Podcasts. There's a link in the episode description to our email. Email us a comment. Uh, actually, one of Carly's best friends was actually made because they're talking about how I sound like a 70s porno. Um, so, and I guess I'm trying to tie that into, I don't know how I'm going to tie porno into this, but my point is... Yeah, so send we, us a comment and you'll be my best friend, basically, is what it boils down to. The point I'm trying to make is... It's that easy. If you reach out to us, we're going to answer and we're going to take your criticism and your critiques to heart because we want to improve the show. Um, this is one thing I really I enjoy about Fish and DMV right now, which is the other podcast and YouTube channel that I run. A lot of comments and feedback. And so it's like easy to try to steer and adjust the show. Mm -hmm. And so everybody that re reaches out to us, we take it all in stride and we want to try to perform, you know, try to perform and make the best content possible. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. thanks. A huge shout out to you. Thank you so much for, for commenting on our video. I really, really do. We really do appreciate it. Um, it makes us feel really good that, you know, people do care besides their parents when they actually watch this stuff. Yeah. But yeah, 40, so, 45 episodes. Damn. I know you're going to try to roll us right into the story, but before we do that, I'd like to also tell you what we're drinking tonight. Oh, good. Tonight we're drinking a white wine spritzer. We got our wine from a local winery called Linganore Wines out in Mount Airy, Maryland. It's close to Frederick, Maryland. If anybody's familiar with that area, usually people are when they're in this area. Um, basically it's called mountain white. It's very, very sweet. Tastes kind of like grapes and fruity. And so we mixed basically half a glass <laughs> of wine with half a glass of our, um, our fizzies, our little bubbly waters, and then add a little bit of lime juice in there just to top it off. Cause we don't have fresh wine, fresh, fresh limes right now. If we had fresh limes, we would totally each have a slice on our glass and it would look super hey, summery man. and beachy, but we don't. So that's what we're drinking tonight. Tom, take it off. So tonight is a story that I've been wanting to tell for a while. Uh, there was this documentary series that was on Netflix and YouTube, and it was called Missing 411. It's a series of books, and it's also a couple of film documentaries, and it, and it documents cases of people who have gone missing in national parks and other places like that. And it maintains that these cases are unusual and mysterious. And at thought there, you'd be like, ah, yeah, but how much of this is true? This is the creepy part is when you actually do the research. And then no matter if you think, and there are tons, and we're going to get at the end of the episode, like the speculations and stuff, like because everyone has like to aliens to just 
people just like falling into a pit or just r- people being abducted by other people or aliens or skin tons of rumors here but the facts are that there are there's something weird going in national parks because the data suggests it and that's what's so creepy i think that's what makes this so creepy and really let's just get into the data portion of it and then carly does have a spooky story to kind of tie into this um people in the united states over six hundred thousand people in the united states go missing every year six hundred thousand and only 10 percent are never like recovered so that's just some data points just to hit you with first so that's over the whole united states wait so only 10 percent people are recovered or are not 90 recovered? let me rephrase that 90 percent of the people are recovered 90 oh. percent of the 600,000 are recovered oh, okay. but 600,000 go missing every that's year in the United States. Out in the woods. that's a lot of people but here's the really creepy part the federal government does not track the number of missing persons that go missing in the national parks but it is believed that over 1600 individuals mysteriously vanish each year who visit these parks that's creepy they just vanish yeah now, that gets to this fun part here that I really want to whip up for you guys. Let's get right to here, Carly. Oh, you look so professional. Look at you bringing up your little word doc. I know, right? But it's this. So, <laughs> here are the top places where people have to either use search and rescue. People go missing every year. Wait, 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 wait. Grand Canyon National Park. Is number one. 785. Per year. Missing people. Per year. Okay. The next is Yosemite National now, Park. Now, now, hear me out. Hear me out. Now, guys, let's just make sure with all this data and if you're watching on YouTube, this is how many times search and rescue are called. Okay. 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 So these are instances. That's what SAR stands for, which is search and rescue. Okay. So this is a little different from the data. I just speed out where 1,600 people per year go missing and they don't know what happened. That's a different stat. So this is just showing like how many times search and rescue are called. And it could be for anything. But these are out with within this numbers is the 1600. If that makes sense. Yeah. So out of all these cases that happen in the United States, how many times is there that search and rescue are called within those times? 1600 of them, people don't know what happened. Right. But I just want you to appreciate the data points here. So I'm just going to go through this list. Number one for search and rescue incidents where search and rescue is being called is the Great Canyon National Park. Grand 700. Canyon. And 85. It's a grand canyon. What did I say? Great. Same thing. It's great and grand. Number two, we're in California. 732 incidents, search and rescue is called. Yosemite National Park in California. Number three, we're in California again. 503 times search and rescue is called per year. And this is the Sequa and Kings Canyon National Parks. No, I can't see it from here. We're going to have to rely on Tom's ability to pronounce words. So. How's that? Sequoia? I think you did a better job than I did. Look at that. Ha. Go Tom. And then that, those are the top three, but we're going to get into some other interesting stats that I have here. Let me just go down this list just to give you a vibe for everything that's on here. Yellowstone National Park is on this list at number four. It has 371 times per year that search and rescue is called. And then we'll go down to more of our neck of woods in the Appalachia. Woo-hoo. Number 11, Great Smoky Mountain National Park. 109, 198 times per year. I can fucking read. 198 times per year that they're called. Woo. That's per year. Great Smoky Mountains. Smoky Mountains are really in the Tennessee, Georgia area. That's a lot. Isn't that creepy? Colorado is number five, 341. Zion National Park is six, 285. But this is the one that really creeped me out. Shenandoah National Park is 15, with 131 missing Whoa, every year. Oh, Shenandoah. That's how many times National Park. So even the one that we live right next to has over 131 episodes where search and rescue are called each year. So out of all these that are compiled, and there's other ones, these are just the big top 15 that made this list. Mm-hmm. Out of all of this, every year, 1,600 go missing, and they don't know why. Mm-hmm. So that means search and rescue is called in all these times. And out of all these times, there's at least 1,600 per year where search and rescue is like, we don't know what the fuck happened. And that led into this next piece of data, which is quite interesting, which is what this individual called 10 profile points that he used when he thinks when these 
crazy incidents happen, a lot of these things check the box. Number one, point of separation. There's some point where you saw somebody and then you didn't. And so example is in one of the stories. Like they vanished. They vanished. Disappeared. Yeah. So the point of separation. So in this one instance, this guy went hunting in the um, in the New York, New York Appalachian train, the Appalachian chain. He went with like four or five other people. He sat down on a rock and then no one heard from him again. Mm-hmm. And so point of separation there. Time of disappearance. Like the, it, it, it's so weird, like how long that they're gone for. And this means two different things. Like you're right there with them and five minutes later, boom, they're gone. Mm -hmm. So it's a very short turnaround time of disappearance. And the other part is like how long they're gone for. Some of these people, like literally there's just no trace. They never turn up again. Other people will turn up within like two or three weeks and you just, they didn't know what happened to them. Boulder fields seem to also, number three, be a big indicator. Wherever there's boulder fields, that's where a lot of people end up going missing. That's strange. Which also gets back to the Grand Canyon National Park being number one. Because the Grand Canyon Park is, you know, all rock. Mm-hmm. Near water makes sense, especially in the Grand Canyon and Yosemite. And then um, Kings Canyon National Park. Okay, that tracks. Disability or illness. This is a little interesting here. This will get into our next thing where there have been people, these people that usually go missing, they're either really young, they're really old, or they have some kind of disability. Oh, interesting, right? Yeah. This one's freaky. And this one freaked me out. I think this one freaked Carly out too. Dogs cannot track the scent. Canines have a really hard time of finding these individuals. Means it's an alien. It means it's something weird. And there was this one instance of this little boy that went missing and the dogs couldn't find him. They ended up finding his remains on top of a mountaintop. Remember that, Carly? Yeah, I remember that. That one was freaky. Number eight, they're usually, if they're found, if remains are found or if the human is, if the individual is found alive, uh, it's found in an area where it's already been looked. They already looked through that area, Mm -hmm. which got back to the boy story where, you know, they comb that area a couple of times and then they finally found him, which is just, I don't know. That's too late when they found him. Yeah. Yes. Yes. He died, but it's still Well, when you say found, you have to like remember. Found his remains. Yes. Missing clothing, unknown cause of death. So if they do find the remains eventually they usually cannot pinpoint an exact cause of death. Uh, I go back to this one case that we talked about, Carly, that, and again, go see the documentary, where they literally had no idea how he actually died. Mm-hmm. They didn't have any proof. It was all just out. conjecture of like how this, this individual died. Missing clothes. Um, one thing that they always see is like, there's no, like if you're a hunter, they never find your firearm. They never find your boots. Mm-hmm. It, or your boots will be missing. That's like taken weird. off. So your boots would be taken off in the middle of the summertime, but you still have your firearm or maybe your clothes are all disappeared. It's just all freaky stuff. And then the big other one here, geographical clusters. And that just means like a lot of these incidents happen in the same type of area, mm-hmm. which gets back to the number one, one of these top hot spots for this is Yosemite and Yellowstone. Or if you're Carly, it's pronounced Yosemite. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then that we're not even done because we're going to get into the next bit of this thing right there which kind of gets into some of these cases and then let me get here to one of my favorite cases that i i heard about this which is here we go perfect so one of these cases that really caught my eye was jacob gray in 2017 Okay, and then for you guys that are listening, um, I'm going to do my best for the pronunciation. If you guys are watching on YouTube, you can actually follow along on the screen with me. So bear with me. I'm going to do the best I can here. But uh, Jacob Gray, this mysterious was exactly happened. To- I don't know why reading for me when I'm under the pressure of recording is so hard. I never understood that. Um, 22-year-old Jacob Gray will likely never be solved. The athletic young man rode his mountain bike into a rainstorm in a, into Olympic National Park in Washington in April of 2017 and was never seen alive again. His bike and gear were found on the side of a trail, but Gray was nowhere to be found. This kicked off a search, largely championed by his father, Randy, who actually sold his house and closed his contracting business so that he could fully devote his time to searching for his son. That's Mm, sad. sad. 
Randy spent months doing that, all the while theorizing about what could have happened to his child. He considered hypothermia, accidental drowning, and an accident, and so on. He also worried that boogering, boogering, like like a like a burger, burglar, burgerian, b u r g e o n i n g. And Margarian? yes, spoilers, Margarian. guys. Our next episode, I'm just going to try to read Cat in the Hat and we'll see if I can botch with that. Tub actually, too. would be really fun, but we need to be more tipsy for that. Just to be watch Cat in the Hat, yeah. Also, would the, the boogering mental health issues had gotten the best of him? Also, worried that, that his means. ongoing, we're going to call it mental health issues, had gotten the best of him. In August of the same year, he had gotten a phone call that a group of researchers had found Jacob's remain in supplies higher on the mountain than anyone expected. The likely cause of death was hypothermia. This story to me, what's so freaky about this is like how it does hit on a couple of things that he said. You know, it's isolation. The body was found way, way farther than what it was. And then mental illness. Mm -hmm. And this is like right there was the mental illness part of it. Um, it's just very freaky, like how he said everything there very neatly. There was no struggle or whatever. And then he just was up there. Um, and then, you know, the story goes into it more how they searched that area, but it took the second time for them to actually find anything. It, it's just, it's really freaky. Now, the last story, and this kind of, this was big in the news right now, was Gabby. Uh, this happened later this year, uh, or the disappearance last of Gabby. Year, 2021. Yeah, 2021. I'm sorry. So um, almost a year ago. Yeah. You want to read it? Sure. The disappearance of Gabby Petito made international headlines when her boyfriend, Brian Laundrie, returned from their road trip, trip all by himself. The couple who posted heavily about their travels on social media had an ambitious schedule of coast-to-coast -coast national park visits, although several fights between the pair were noticed by others, including the police, along the way. Petito's family said that their last contact with the 22-year-old was at the end of August 2021. Laundry arrived back at home September 1st without Petito and refused to speak with police or her family. Her family reported her missing September 11th. After a lengthy lack of contact, in fact, they don't believe the last text they received from Petito was actually from her. Sadly, on September 19th, Petito's remains were found in Bridger, Bridger Teton National Forest in Wyoming. The cause of death was determined to be strangulation. Laundry disappeared on September 17th, and on October 20th, his skeletal remains were found inside the Carlton Reserve, Reserve in Sarasota, Florida. As of press time his cause of death is still unknown and now with this story here you might think like okay so he murdered her and the family probably got revenge on it but it's just so weird like again it happened in the park gabby had a history of mental illness so did the boyfriend i believe if i'm not mistaken correctly mental illness is there again and so it's like there's a through line here that is very very creepy mm -hmm. um and this also gives me the last one which is of a 27 year old irishman um, who was visiting the Grand Trenton National Park in Wyoming. Um, this individual has been the missing since month. June 2021. Same month. <gasps> oh. This is why I connect all you. Is, this is why it's creepy. Same month. The last known sighting of the Dublin native pinpoints him heading in the direction of Taggart Lake. This is located on an 8-mile or 12-kilometer trail that is very difficult in nature. When he didn't show up to work, he was reported missing. He held dual U.S. and Irish citizenship. His car was found nearby and kicked off a search that formally ended two weeks later. Wow. 45 helicopters <gasps> search 45. and other high-tech tools have yet to reveal any information about his whereabouts. What? His family and the U.S. National Park Services have since put out a poster with a photo and details, as well as a hashtag, find, find Kane, to keep him top of mind for visitors to the area. The disappearance is extra, extra, extra puzzling, as his uncle described that particular trailhead as his favorite. Another hiker reported seeing the individual without a backpack, 
So it appeared that he had just gone out for a walk. What? And this happened the same year as yeah, Gabby. Yeah, that's creepy. Especially if it's his favorite place to hike. That means he knows it really well. And it's so funny. It's like one happened in June and the other one happened in August of the same year. Mm -hmm. And who even goes out with like, you know, water bottle or mm -hmm. something? And it, it's just, I don't know. It, it really, really. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that's a big kicker. Both of them happen in Wyoming. So what do so what do the skeptics suspect is taking these people? What are I, I some know. what are some myths or some beliefs going I, on right so, now? So so one more thing and then we'll put up then we'll put up we'll make the screen back. Oh. But but one more thing we're gonna put a pin on this and we'll get to our really cool story. This is like an interesting thing to me. So it's like you can chalk up her as is Gabby. It's a terrible incident. It's probably like a, a lover's quarrel as right, they would murder. say. And he, yeah, he murdered her. But then, but then when you peel back the layers even more, guys, and it's like, okay, but in the same year, somebody else goes missing. You're like, that's ah, no big deal. But this also happened in the same state. Okay, that's a little bit weird. And then it happened like a month and a half apart in the same state on the same year. It was the same park. I think it was the same park, too. It was too. the same park. Like, that's freaky. Yeah. That's where it gets freaky. Right. So, I don't know. Like and the, and the fact is like there are tons and then when you look at the data that six hundred thousand people go missing every year ninety percent of them are you know found but then there are hundreds and hundreds I and mean, we brought up the stats like what was it that one park had over five hundred and that, I think that was the number three per year search and rescue are called on this one park five hundred times a year so out of all these times that search and rescue is called the fact That's more that, than once a day yeah and the fact that sixteen hundred per year just vanish yeah. And then what makes it even more incriminating or just weird is the fact that they don't keep these stats of like how many people like disappear and never come back. It's a guess at 1600. That's even freakier. Right. Like the they fact don't even really record it. They, they don't kind of just it. have it like, eh, it's about. Yeah. Like that's creepy. And, and to think like these are just parks. And that's what really made my blood like just, just freeze was that the Smoky Mountains and then Shenandoah National Park was on that list. Because you always, I always thought where we are, it's like, it's Arizona. It's Yellowstone. It's right, like, it's right. These, it's out in the boonies. It's yeah, out to like, you not, know, where you can just get lost out in the ether. Yeah. But here. But, and that's what's that so way. creepy is like, how far do you have to go out to actually be in a survival situation? And this leads me to my last bit, which was a little quote from Les Stroud. And he was talking about, you don't have to go far to get yourself into like a survival situation. Who's Les Stroud? Tom? Oh, Les Stroud is a survival expert. Um, He's done Survivor Man. He's also done a really... Uh, the, the Wild Harvest, really good show. Um, but anyway, I digress. So I'm going to out here. It says, like, you don't really have to go far. You don't have to really go out into the unknown to get yourself into a bad situation. All you have to do is go on a nice afternoon backpacking trip, and you just take the wrong trail. And you keep telling yourself that it's okay. I just have to go a little bit further and just a little bit further. And you let the pride get the better of you. And all of a sudden, a little mistake can become life or death. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about the, this family that grew up in Oregon that went to pick mushrooms because it was mushroom season and they went the wrong way down the trail. Pride took the better of them and they kept moving. And then what ended up happening was that one afternoon of picking mushrooms, they almost died. All of them got hyper, bad hyperthermia, not hyperthermia to the point of death, but they were out in the Oregon rainforest, basically when it was raining, mm. they got separated from their car. They went the wrong way. And all of a sudden that's how fast it happened. I know this because he actually did a Survivor Man episode based on this family and how they parked the car at the edge of the trail and they just they took the wrong turn and they kept going deeper into the forest and then they got disoriented. Mm. That's how quickly it can happen. And so with that information in mind from a survival expert, it really contextualizes this too that it doesn't have to be Yellowstone. You can go out into you know a 200-acre national park and if you go off the wrong track or just something happens and – what I love is this last quote is like, it's usually when you don't expect it. Mm -hmm. If you go out and this is, I love this one. So here, and this is a paraphrasing friend, but if you say you're going to go spend a week on a desert Island, you mentally prep for that because it is so extreme. Or if you're going to go to the Arctic, but you don't plan for just going on an afternoon backpacking thing right. because you tell yourself it's just going to be two or three hours. Right. And that to me stuck. I was like, absolutely. If, if, if me and Seth, that's like, the most dangerous. Yeah. If me and Seth said, we're going to go hike the Appalachian trail for a month. Right. You mentally think I'm going to pack all this stuff, mm -hmm. but it's so true. If you just like on a Sunday afternoon, want to go with content, which is her friend is like, Oh, let's just go hiking for a mile. 
you don't think like, well, what if all these bad things happen? You just go. Mm -hmm. It's a little cold. Eh, it's fine. I'll just, I'll just go out there anyway. Right. And that's just so crazy. He's like, yeah, that's probably when people really do get in trouble the most is when they just think like, it's just going to be a short little bike ride. It's yeah. going to be a short little hike or a run. Because they don't have anything that yeah. they would possibly need. And right. I remember this too, and this will get into the story. I, just, I, I have a boat and I've taken the boat out and it's usually the short trips that have gotten me in the most trouble. I don't pack my rain gear. I don't pack an extra sweatshirt. You know, when I'm pre-fishing for like a tournament or whatever, you pack everything in the boat. You don't know what's going to happen. Right. I have a helmet. I have extra water. I keep everything. But if I do a little short trip, I've gotten caught out in storms before. I'm like, I was freezing. And if it was something like bad, like the boat died or I was stranded out there, I could have gotten a lot. I could have gotten a really serious issue. And it was always places close to the house mm -hmm. because I just, you don't think that something bad will happen when you're so close. Yeah. So I, I'm going to leave you with those thoughts here while we get into our story. But whether you believe it's the supernatural, like some people do, whether you believe like what Les does is like people just kind of like, they assume it's close to them. It's hunters that are always very prideful. Like, they've been there a hundred times and they just make a mistake. Mm -hmm. Or if you think it's skinwalkers. I don't know. Sasquatch. Yeah. Or an alien. I like to see what you guys think down down below in the comment section. So with that said, Carly, what do you have for us tonight? All right, everybody. Prepare yourselves for the tale of the missing persons case. I currently work as a cop in a pretty small town. It's surrounded by woods and parks. The forests are not part of any national park system, but I feel as if it's as big as one. I have to be vague about the area because I don't think my boss would appreciate me talking about this case. It's pretty big news considering nothing ever happens in this area. When a child goes missing in the woods, it should be big news. When two goes missing, it's more than news. I never told anyone the truth about what happened in those woods when I took a day looking for those children. I, I'm certain that if my boss heard of any of this, he would strip me of my badge and send me off to head to a doctor. But I have to get, I have to tell this in hopes I get any information about who I came across that day. I had an early midlife crisis and changed careers. I came, uh, I came from a long line of police officers and had planned that to be my future. But because of some complicated and boring reasons, I chose to do something else with my life. Then later on, I regretted my choices and I did what I needed to do to become a cop. Even though I looked on the older side, I didn't actually have a lot of experience in law enforcement. The place that hired me didn't need someone who did, just the person that looked the part. Nothing happened in this small town, just some easy to break up bar brawls. Hell, they couldn't even be called brawls. I feel as if they only hired me so I could go through their ancient fi filing system and update it because my boss refused to do it. While I was organizing the mountain of old paperwork and cases, I found out this town had a pretty regular pattern of hikers going missing on the trails. But after looking at the nat national average, I guess our town wasn't anything special. Nothing sinister going on. People just get lost. I'd only been working at my new job for six months when the uproar started. A child had gone missing on one of the easier and shorter hikes with his family. His father had turned his head to talk to his wife, and when he looked back, his little boy was gone. Mm -mm. They had thought that he had just ducked behind a tree to scare them, but after looking through the entire area, they grew panicked. The mother stayed where they last saw him, and the father ran to get help by a, by a ranger station. They quickly organized a search for the boy. The mother stayed in that spot for nearly 10 hours, waiting and watching, not knowing what else to do. I'm not a hiker myself, but I joined the volunteers and searched for the boy. Any spare moment I had, I was doing whatever I could to help. I ended up with hundreds of bug bites and torn ankles torn ankles from new boots but I never complained a child was out in the woods and we couldn't find any trace of him to get even darker then a girl was lost she was a classmate of the boy and wanted to help some volunteers humored her and let her run water to people searching but she could only go a few feet into the woods 
If she saw someone coming near the end, near the trail end, she would run up and give them a cold water bottle. She was in sight the entire time. Again, someone turned their head as she took a step onto the trail, and when they turned back, she was gone. The people who said she had been walking towards hadn't turned their heads. The people who she had been walking toward hadn't turned their heads. They were completely bewildered and questioned what they had seen. Mm -hmm. She simply was gone in a blink of an eye. No one had a logical reason for it. So they didn't dwell on how the children disappeared, only that they now had two missing. Helicopters came and scent dogs joined the search. But after a week, the search was, the search was trying to recover a body. Two children under the age of 10 in the woods for that long wasn't likely to last. I had been doing whatever I could in those days, but felt useless. My boss noticed how badly this case was on my health and forced me to take a day off. After all, I wasn't a hiker or an expert in cases like these. I had done everything I could, and if I kept hiking, I would burn myself out. I felt like there was more than enough people looking. I could rest for a day and got back to it full force. I did not listen to him. I did not go to bed early the night before so I could be up at the crack of dawn. Oh, I'm sorry. I did get I did go to bed early the night before so I could be up at the crack of dawn to go back to the trails. I wasn't a part of the volunteer team and my boss told them I shouldn't be out there that day. They gave me some looks but let me go hiking as long as I promised to stay on the short trails and not go into the woods, which I agreed. I could get lost and that wouldn't help anyone. No. I knew I wouldn't find any traces of the children on the trail that had been looked over at least a hundred times before, but I still couldn't just stay home. That's how I spent my free day, hiking trails and getting more blisters on my ankles. I had a backpack of some supplies. Even though I had hiked for the entire day, I wasn't very hungry. I think the stress was getting to me. I still had some water and a granola bar in my, in my pack near the end of the day. I was in the middle of a somewhat longer trail I had gotten permission to search on when the sun had started to set. I decided to start heading back, but knew it would be dark by the time I arrived at the end of the trail and to the ranger station in the front of the woods. I knew I wasn't going to find anything, but I still felt disappointed, ending the day empty-handed. The orange light of the sun had faded into a gray light, a strange gray light that made bright colors pop. I had forgotten how strange that time of day looked. My orange shirt nearly looked neon in the gray light. Because of the odd light, I saw a bright white on the trail, easier than I might have any other different time of the day. The trail had a slope to it. I had just reached the top, ready to go down, when I saw that white on the trail. I squinted to see a person standing wearing a long white and baggy sweater. The day had been hot and not at all sweater weather. The person was short and my heart started to race, but this person didn't look short enough to be seven. But it was still very strange to see a preteen just standing in the middle of the trail. I went down the slope towards them, hoping I looked friendly and they didn't book it to the woods. Hey, are you all right? I asked when I was a few steps away from them. At first, I thought they had been wearing a long white hat of some sort, but when I got closer, I saw their hair was pure white. Mm. Either this was a very short, older person, or this child dyed their hair. I noticed they weren't wearing any shoes and found that strange. Their feet weren't dirty from walking in the woods, and I didn't see any abandoned shoes around the trail. I had no idea how they went bare feet without tearing up their soles. Hearing my voice, they turned to face me. They were a child like I had first thought. Their hair fell over their face, making it hard to see. I guessed they were a boy, even if they had hair on the longer side. Alarm bells were ringing just in the back of my head, but I couldn't ignore a lost child in the middle of the woods. I'm a cop. You're safe. My name's Hugh. I was carrying my badge in my backpack, and I held it out for the boy to see. The boy still hadn't spoken or reacted in the slightest, but at least he was looking at me, showing me he was listening. Are you lost? Where are your parents? I asked as gently as I could. I couldn't blame the boy for being scared of a random man. 
coming up to him in the woods. I hoped he trusted me enough to bring him to the ranger station so he could get help. We had to find out where the, his family were and make sure he wasn't in any kind of trouble. Mm -hmm. Protective instincts I didn't even know I had were kicking in. I wanted to carry him out of the woods to make sure he wouldn't hurt his feet walking, but getting any answer from the kid would be a win. Best not to make him too uncomfortable. He hadn't responded to any of my questions, so I got down on his level and kept trying. What's your name? Ellie. I finally got something out of him. His voice was soft, so I could barely hear it, but I had a name. I'm going to the ranger station. How about you come with me? If you feel comfortable with it, we could hold hands so you don't get lost. I saw his hands fidget a little at the end of his large sweater and his eyes darted back and forth considering what I had said. Because I had gotten down a bit lower, I could see his eyes through his white hair. His hair wasn't dyed. He was albino, judging by his pink, reddish eyes. A rare condition I had never seen in person before. Mm -mm. I heard people with the condition had bad eyesight. It would be dark soon, and I was surprised there was still light after how long we had been speaking. Holding hands would be a good idea if he couldn't see when the sun did, did finally set. He came to a decision and held out his hand to let me take it. He seemed like a shy kid, so I didn't push any more conversation, and I took my small win. When we started to walk, I kept an eye on the ground, making sure I was guiding him away from anything that might harm his feet. I wish I had brought a pair of extra socks that day. Ellie was very light-footed, though. He carefully walked around the twigs on tiptoes as if it was his, it's, as if it were second nature to him. I remember not wearing shoes as a child, so maybe he had just adjusted without them. I wished I had a way to leave a note where I found him. If his parents were nearby, they would be worried, but I assumed that they would go where we were headed once they couldn't find him. I had my phone on me. I was glad it was still charged. Still holding Ellie's hand, I tried to unlock my phone with one hand. It had frozen, which I thought was weird. It had never frozen before. I tried to restart it and lock my screen and unlock my screen, but the clock remained at the same time. It was when I first checked it. The sun hadn't set and my phone clock wasn't moving. I wanted to call the station saying I found Ellie, but no matter what I tried, my phone just refused to work. That's creepy. I shoved it into my pocket to try and use it again a different time. As we walk down the slope, I get hit with deja vu. I thought I had already walked down this slope. In fact, I thought I found Ellie at the bottom, but I ignored it. The woods all looked the same to me. I could just be getting confused by my surroundings in the dark. I was never a good hiker, but when we hiked up another slope and came down again, I was seriously starting to think a tree growing on top of a boulder was the same one we had just passed. My throat started to get dry and panic was rising in my chest. Why did everything look the same? Why had the sun not set yet? And why would my phone clock not move? I pushed those worries down until we passed by the same tree growing on top of the boulder a third time. I didn't want to stress out Ellie, who had silently been walking beside me the entire time. Ellie, could you do me a favor? I don't mean to worry you, but could you stand right here as I look over that slope ahead of us? I just, I just want to look ahead. I swear I won't leave you. The boy gave me a nod and it looked like he didn't want to let go of my hand, but he let it go, and I half jogged up the trail to the small hill in front of us. When I started to walk away, Ellie had crouched over and started to shove sticks into the dirt. When I saw, when I saw at the top of the hill gave me tunnel vision. I thought I was going to faint. I stood staring at Ellie, crouching over, playing with sticks. I looked behind me and saw the same thing. This couldn't be happening. What the heck? I had to be seeing things. Maybe Ellie had a twin and they were messing with me. I jogged down and I walked over to the tree I was using as a landmark. I put my useless phone on top of a root. Ellie was staring at me and I, ga and I gave him a smile. Humor me, I told him. 
and started up the slope again. When I reached the top, still had his line of Ellie still had his line of sticks, but I felt a weight in my pocket. My phone was no longer on the tree root. It had returned to my pocket. Hmm. What the hell? I asked myself. I had to be going crazy. Maybe the stress had finally gotten to me. I couldn't be stuck in a loop. These things just didn't happen. I walked down and stopped in front of Ellie, wondering what my face would look like in that moment. If this was really happening, then Ellie might know something. After all, when I found him, the loop started. But I wasn't ready to put any blame on him yet. <laughs> okay. okay. I might Hugh. have to kill the boy. I know. Okay, Hugh. <laughs> what are you going to have to do to survive, Hugh? I'm going to climb a tree, I said. <laughs> Hands on my hips. A hint of smile flickered on Ellie's face. I had no idea what else to do. Clearly, I couldn't walk along the trail without getting brought back. But I wasn't about to risk going into the woods. I would get put back on the trail or get lost in the trees. Maybe, just maybe, if I climbed high enough, I could see something interesting. Or maybe the loop didn't reach high in the air. It was something I could try. I placed my bag at the base of the boulder tree and started to climb. Watch my bag for me, champ. You can have the water and snacks if you want, though, I told Ellie and started to climb. I wasn't much for climbing, but the branches were thick and close together, so it made it easy. The tree was almost made for it. I slowly made my way up, getting covered in leaves, sap, and scratches from the bark. I didn't know when I should stop. I made the mistake of looking down and froze in fear for a few seconds. I learned in that moment I was afraid of heights, but I had to keep going. I had to get out of there and find a way to get Ellie out of the woods. I don't know how long it took me, but I made it nearly to the top and where I could no longer grab branches to support my weight. I looked around, seeing nothing special, but I was still in the tree so maybe the loop didn't reach that high up. I took a risk and climbed one more branch when the world went dark. I realized that the sun had set in a blink of an eye. I looked up at a starry sky through the branches before an immense force suddenly knocked me from my perch. It felt like an invisible hand had grabbed around me and plowed my body through all the branches I had just climbed. The pain was nothing I had ever felt before. I heard my legs break before I felt it. My ribs were crushed and a knock to my skull, thankfully making my world dark. When I woke up, I was on the bottom of the trail, right next to Ellie, who I'm pretty sure was just poking me with a stick. I screamed, sitting up, patting my body, looking for what was broken, only to find myself in one piece. I was breathing hard, looking frank frantically around to see, uh, to see I was back in the gray light of that trail and my body healed. Not even the tree sap remained. I guess that didn't work, I said with a small laugh, enough through, though I wanted to cry. My body was healed, but I still held that memory of the pain. Did she have a gun or a flare gun? Uh, not like, that I know I don't of. Know, or like rope? I don't. It was a good idea. I don't think I've ever seen someone find an opening of the loop before. Ellie commented in his small, soft voice. He had spoken about the loop. I no longer could doubt what was happening. The whole thing was now in the open, and we needed to talk about it. I'm stuck in a loop, I said slowly, not fully believing it. Yes, you are, Ellie said with a nod. He was making doodles in the dirt with his stick, as if the strangest thing wasn't happening. He's probably been there a while, too, so he's probably already had his mental episodes. Like all of this was normal. I stared at him and the sticks he had placed in a circle in the dirt, and I thought suddenly, and a thought suddenly came to me. I'm stuck, but you're not. The sticks Ellie had been playing with remained when my phone was returned. It may have been because Ellie hadn't moved, but his wording made me clue in. He didn't agree we were both stuck, just myself. I pulled my pack next to him and patted on it giving him a place to comfortably sit all right champ take a seat let's figure out what's going on with both of us and the unlimited time i'm sure we can figure out why this is happening 
You are not going to accuse me of trapping you? Ellie said. And the surprised tone in his voice was the most emotion he'd shown since we met. Nope, you don't seem the type. I could have sworn I saw his ears turn a little red through his hair. He sat on my backpack, knees tucked inside his sweater, making him look very small. But for the small child he was, I knew in that moment he might not be human. Duh. But lucky for myself, he had the answers to what was going on. Humans are born to die. Most creatures are. You cannot understand. And endless existence. Not truly understand it. If you did, you would become something else. That is the purpose of this loop. For you to become something else. In this place, you cannot die. You just remain for your mind to rot or turn. The one that created this place reproduces this way. If your mind turns and you become something else, it twists your flesh into something the same as itself. The ones who cannot make the change are eaten. The loop keeps the victims fresh. I assume the missing children on the trail were taken for food. Children don't often manage the change. I got goosebumps. Well, that's fucking creepy as shit, guys. What the fuck? <laughs> I got goosebumps listening to Ellie's words. Tom did too. Yeah. I hated the idea of those two kids being trapped the way I was. Stuck in a forever loop, not understanding what was happening and not being able to get out. I was lucky enough to come across something to explain things to me. Ellie kept talking, so I pushed my thoughts aside to listen. Humans cannot break this loop. I am not human, so I cannot be trapped here. But I cannot break this loop to save you. It goes against what I am. I cannot save a human from a creature of the night. I, however, can make this offer to you once. I can turn you into something else. Once you come to my side, I can save you. I can remove you from these woods. I cannot guarantee your humanity, though. You may end up as something far worse than the creature that has trapped you here. Ellie stared at me so intensely with his red eyes. It felt like the forest was closing in on me, waiting to hear my answer. I could either become a creature after suffering through the endless amount of time, or take him up on his offer and become something else, or take a huge risk. No thank you. I said, with a small smile. To my surprise, Ellie smiled back. A small one, but still a smile. I knew he wasn't going to offer to turn me again, but I also knew Ellie was here for a reason. Maybe that reason would help me get out of this mess. It's best for you to stay silent as I take care of why I am here. I cannot promise your life. I need to summon the creature who made this loop and speak with it. It may eat you, Ellie said. As That's he stood up. fucking creepy. Fuck. Oh my god. Jesus Christ. Sorry, guys. I told I'm you this like, was a good one. Fuck. I told you. Could you imagine if this happens to all these fuckers in the national parks that go through this? You get the fucking Ellie. Like, would They've you like got to be Ellie turned? in the woods, little I, al, albino oh. Ellie hanging the, out in the these woods. These monsters think, like, you know what? This is the most like, alluring do, thing. Do, 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 do. A demon eyed child would clearly be the best bait yeah. to get people. Yeah. Oh my god. All right. Super creepy. I want to call my dog right now. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, continue. Go for it. I watched him as he walked into the middle of the trail. He stood waiting for me to, to nod and give him a small wave telling him I was ready to maybe die in the next few minutes. Not much else I could do about it. He gave me a nod back, then stomped down hard on the dirt, packed ground. I thought I heard some sort of hollow echo and the faintest silver light coming from him when he stomped. My body sensed the creature before I saw it. Every hair on the back of my neck stood on end and my hands started to shake. I had never been so scared in my life. I honestly would rather be thrown from a tree 100 times than be sitting on the trail when this creature showed itself. It was enormous, a black mass that flickered through the trees like a ghost. 
Its white glowing eyes and clawed black hands looked solid enough though. Wrapping one hand around a tree, it looked so big it could easily rip that tree from the roots. Even though it was massive, its voice was barely a whisper. It was right in front of us and yet I could barely get a look, get a good look. It was like my eyes refused to focus on the thing that I was supposed to see. What creatures has wandered into my forest? It reached out a large claw towards Ellie, who stood firm. Even in my state, I wanted to run out and protect him. The claw stopped right in front of his face when Ellie started to speak. You have created far too many children. Your limit was two. You are taking too many humans to feed them. And I suspect you took this other human to create a new. Ellie's strong words were cut off by a rasping laugh from the woods that made my skin crawl. This forest is mine. I can make as many children as I like. Now be gone. The massive claw came down to crush poor Ellie, and I shot to my feet. I was far too slow, but my concern was not needed. The moment the ghastly claw came down, it exploded into a silver mist. The creature let out a shriek of pain and darted further back into the woods, nursing its wound. Ellie had not moved, and his back was turned to me, but I could feel he was very angry. You cannot be, the monster hissed with a voice full of hate. The Silver King is dead. I can never die, and you have insulted me beyond going past your child limit. As a punishment, you must kill the most recent ones you have created. You must also break the loops of the humans you have trapped. Humans that are most suited to be returned to their world are just to live peacefully. You'll go hungry for a while, but be thankful for your life. The monster hissed more and darted back and forth between the trees, considering what to do. It clearly wanted to kill Ellie, but couldn't. I didn't believe that Ellie, the small child before me, was a scarier monster than the dark thing in the woods. But the proof was the thing not attacking again. With more pacing and hateful hissing, it agreed. Oh, thank you, my Silver King, for sparing my life this night. I shall never forget it. Never. I had never heard such pure hate before. It made me feel sick just listening to that dreadful voice. I had no idea how Ellie stood so still with him, directed towards him. He was a tough kid, it seemed. I expected something special to happen, but I just blinked and everything returned to normal. It was dark, meaning the sun had finally set. Ellie stood in the same spot, the monster in the woods was gone. I checked my phone, finding it to be working again, but I didn't use it to call for help. I knew I was safe to walk to the end of the trail and out of the woods. Ellie looked at me with a hard-to-read look on his face. It lightened when I offered my, eye, my hand to him so we could continue the way we had started. Even in the dark, I saw his face flush a little. He was a big, important figure among very scary creatures. I don't think he often was treated like the child he was and appreciated the gesture. I wish I had spoken to him on our walk. I didn't know what to say after everything I had seen. I was going through ideas in my head when I saw something else on the trail in front of us. My throat closed. I felt tears come to my eyes. The missing children stood alone, holding hands, looking very scared. I let go of Ellie's hand to run over to the poor lost children. I checked them over, finding them to be safe and perfectly fine. But when I looked back, Ellie was gone. I was a bit suspicious bringing two of the missing kids out of the woods, two kids that should have been dead and looked the same as they did when they had gone missing, but I had a solid alibi. When they had been on the trails, one of me was on camera buying gas, the other one was of me with 10 other volunteers when the little, when the little girl had gone missing. Some people thought I was working with the ones that had taken them, but with no proof, the matter dropped quickly. No one could explain what happened, and I was not offering my strange tale. 
The kids said they had just been stuck in one spot for a long time and didn't get hungry. Since they were so young, the police didn't know what to make of it. The case came to a standstill, but most people were just happy the kids were found. Since then, I wondered about Ellie. I can't but think how he's doing out there and if he's safe. Of course he's safe. He seems like a big deal, but I can't help myself. And I've been looking, trying to find any mention of him, but so far nothing. And that was the tale of the missing persons case. The Silver King. Yeah. That is a damn good story. Wow. There was some effort put into that thing. Wow. Yeah, guys, I, was awesome. I got nothing for you. Um, That's off Reddit, guys. I found it on Reddit. I can't take the credit for it, but it was a really good story. And that's why anytime I hear 411 now, I think aliens. Definitely, Ellie. A little red eyed albino alien. Just a time loop. Yeah. Like that whole thing. Like, too. doesn't that like, make sense, though? Yeah. They're stuck in a time loop. Literally, the sun never goes down, never rises. It just, just in stays purgatory. the same. It's purgatory. Yeah. That's as a parent. This, would you rather have the closure immediately that you know your child, like you have closure, or you want to be living with the what if? That's an impossible question to answer. Your dog. Closure or what if? Maybe what if. Yeah, I think what if. I because think what if. if my dog, if I can't find my dog ever, then I can think that maybe a family found him and took care of him for the rest of his days. Yeah. I'm sorry. Like I know it's depressing, but to think about it's it. It's not but... how it really works for people. Like humans don't just get adopted out in the woods, but dogs no. do. <laughs> but you hope. Yeah. And I don't know, like the idea of hope and close. I don't know. Like that's what's hard about this too. Is like it's just devastating. Yeah, it's really scary. Uh, link in the episode description to the author of this story, along with the story my notes. Guys, let us know what you thought about that. Week forty five is in the books. Uh, a little fun thing, just to kind of. I just thought we'd do this because honestly, I kind of already did the scary stuff in the news, which was like all the four one one cases. Sorry about that. So. <laughs> It's like, yeah, I kind, of, I kind of blew my load there, so I wanted to show. Sorry for that, that was graphic, but um, so we this is week 45, so I thought this would be a fun thing. What happened 10 weeks ago at week 35? Well, at week 35, we did the exorcism on April 14th, that's the one that we did, and that one has over 100, 100 plus views. Um, just a little like I don't throw back to that, so I thought that's pretty cool. Um, I guys, I got nothing. That's an insanely good story. <laughs> that blew me. That Let's was just ended, baby. Yeah, that was as good as on um, the trees are sleeping. I know that one didn't do as well. I think it's because like it originally didn't do as well because we like dumped it on a Saturday. But the point was like that story got under my skin. Yeah, this story was way better. This is now the best story I've heard in a long time. Yeah, where it got my attention. It's like oh shit, like this is some depth here. <sighs> like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you guys next time on Spirits and Ghost Stories. Bye. Bye.